All right, okay guys, just a few other points uh, on this, on, on the uh, modeling uh, uh, module. Uh, I just wanted to remember we discussed briefly the other day, where well, I've left the point of here. Anyway, so it doesn't matter. Remember we discussed the other day, I warned you about getting too caught up in these uh, mathematical models, especially the, the forecast based models. AFP is reliable because AFP there's no risk. If you get an opportunity to do a classical riskless arbitrage, you should always grab it with both hands, with as much volume and do it for as much volume as possible, because that's a true profit that is locked in. Okay, but in the forecast-based valuation model, most of the models that we use in finance are actually forecast-based valuation. Okay, so this is uh, therefore I warned you about the fallibility of those models. Okay, because usually those forecasts will go wrong, and therefore what you thought was the fair value may not end up being the fair value. All right. So there's a very important point uh, that uh, very important quote from Howard Fox. So I hope you understand what this means. That remember I talked to you about the that most human beings have a quantitative fetish. Okay, you, most human beings have a fetish for things that are expressed in for mathematical terms because we think it must be good because it's so quantitative, right? And the more complex it is, the more human beings get seduced. Okay, they think it must be better because it's more complex. All right. So therefore, uh, you understand the statement. This is actually from a Howard Marks interview. I couldn't locate that particular clip. You understand the statement? It's meant to be funny, but you understand what it means? Yes. That most people would rather be precisely right than uh, precisely wrong than approximately right. Okay. So most people are uh, very focused on being precise. Okay. So this is one warning from uh, somebody also who's also in the investment business. Okay. And I've given you a link to the Howard Marks memos. Please read them. He, uh, he, there's a very long, very big archive of Howard Marks memos, so everybody should read them. Okay, very, very educative for you about how to look at the market. Okay, and one of the things you'll notice when you read Howard Marks' memos is he will, you will get this vibe that he also is not obsessed with models. Okay, and uh, so generally you find people who have to have, actually have to manage money on a day-to-day -day basis. They are not. Uh, they are aware of the fact. They are. They are actually much more. They're using methods which are much less precise than the impression you would get from uh, many of the courses that you see. Okay, there's another little clip from YouTube on one of the Berkshire Hathaway meetings. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger talking about projections. Okay, so here Warren, this I'm not going to play the clip. You listen to it yourself. Uh, Warren Buffett is actually saying at one point that I've never used projections to buy a company. Okay. So arguably the most, uh, the greatest equity investor of all time has never used projections to buy a company. Okay, and then the last one is, uh, you know, he looks at, uh, he, he puts a great deal of emphasis on the qualitative assessment of the management team. So that's a very, uh, that's a very important part of his assessment. The qualitative assessment of the management team, and that's not just Buffett actually. If you look at most of the venture capital guys, if you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley, in, uh, Silicon Valley most of the venture capital guys you'll notice are focused on the individual. Okay, so if they think that Sina is a good manager, he has an ability to manage a business, they will not care whether Sina is investing in a technology sector or in a in the food product sector or real estate. They will go with the personality, with the person, with the individual. Okay, they are not typically most of the venture capitalists you'll find are in the tend to tend to be industry agnostic. Industry agnostic means agnostic means I don't really care. Okay, so I trust Sina's competence. So whatever sector he goes into, I'm going to back him. On the other hand, if I don't trust Jan's confidence, I don't really care what industry is in. I'm not going to invest with him. Okay, so it's not just Buffett. So this is very big even among the VC players. You'll see this if you watch more and more VC interviews. Okay, so the last one is because Kraft Heinz is a recent story, and you guys are going for interviews. There's very good analysis of Kraft Heinz. Uh, done by Ashwat Damodaran in this video. So I would suggest you go through this, okay? And so his Damodaran's valuation techniques are good because they're very grounded in reality. Okay, he talks a lot about the industry factors as well. So this is a useful thing to learn because it's a topical issue because now there's a big uh, decline. Okay, all right. So and then we have this stuff in the lower part, which is talking about station, not stationarity that you read on your own. Just get a flavor for it, okay? Uh, even if you can't figure out what's going on. But at least get a flavor for that. Okay, so now we're going to go into any questions at this stage? Okay, let's go here. 
this is our actually we need to get into our uh, options KB so that you can actually do your project so these are your readings from Halbasu this part we have done aspects of an option contract we have done fair value models okay then we went at this point there is the hyperlink to the models page which is where this is all your information over there okay so this is linking directly from there as well okay now comes our next topic on uh, moneyness of options okay so we just have to cover a few things quickly and uh, so that we can all right okay guys now quickly read this so that uh, you can understand and uh, so there are two terms that we are trying to learn here, intrinsic value and time value, okay? I've tried to just use mathematical notation in the brackets, so I didn't have to write value twice. So generally the value or the price of an option can be split up into two parts, intrinsic value and time value, okay? So the first one is for calls, and the second, the formula that you see, the first one is for calls, and the second one is for puts, okay? So just make sure you understand this stuff. <coughs> Maybe we should make it a little smaller here. So everything goes up. Can everyone see the last line? Yes. You can see it, the last line you guys at the back. Okay, so the first one, so understand what intrinsic value is. The first line is for calls. The second line is for puts. That first sign, this, this sign is an equal to sign. I don't know if it's so clear. This sign is equal to, this is also equal to, this is also equal to, this is minus obviously. Is everyone clear about this? Alright. Alright, so this is for calls, this is for puts, okay. And this is the general definition, time value is equal to, actually option premium, this is the right way to look at it. Take this option premium to the LHS, bring the time value, to, uh, bring the intrinsic value, uh, let this option premium remain on this side, bring, take the intrinsic value to the left LHS. So, time value plus intrinsic value is equal to option premium. Is this clear? Yes. We are coming to that, we are coming to that, okay? So first, essentially, so uh, Pranav's question is, what is the time value, okay? So first get this relationship right, that the total option premium is equal to time value plus intrinsic value. Is this clear? Okay. Now, if intrinsic value is, in the case, we'll just do the example with respect to calls, okay? We'll just do the example with respect to calls. So, in the case of calls, we're going to answer Pranav's question of what is intrinsic value. So, first, we make note of this uh, axiom that the time value, that the total option premium can be split up into time value and intrinsic value, okay? So, first, we want to understand what intrinsic value is, okay? So in the case of calls, intrinsic value is current stock price minus strike price, okay? So if the current stock price is 85, let's say, okay, and the uh, strike price is uh, 75, what is the intrinsic value here? $10. Current stock price, I said, is 85, and the uh, strike price is 75. Okay. So this clear? So essentially what is intrinsic value? The idea in intrinsic value is that uh, what is the money that you can, what is the profit that you can lock in if you buy the option and immediately exercise the option? You guys are all familiar with option exercise? Yes. Are you all familiar with exercise of options? Yes? No? no? Yes. Who is not familiar? Yes. Daron, uh, you are not familiar? Okay. So exercise of options was covered in FM1 and FM2? Yes. Okay, exercise of options is nothing but you know what a call option is. Call option is an option to buy. Yes. Okay, so when I exercise the call option, these I essentially exercise that right to buy because the call option gives me the right to buy, but not I don't have an obligation. So when I exercise my right, that's called the exercise of the option. That means I actually give up the option and I buy the underlying stock. Okay, and the strike price or the exercise price is the price at which I will do that. When I exercise my right, the strike price, remember we discussed strike price in relation to the number of things that we have to clarify when looking for an option price. The aspects of an option that you have to clarify, one of the things is the strike price. Remember that? Right? So, therefore, intrinsic value of calls is very clear. Is it not clear now? If the current stock price is, let's say now let's do another example. The current stock price is 100 and the strike price of my call option is uh, 70. 
Then what is the intrinsic value? 30. Okay, 30 is the intrinsic value because I can exercise, I can buy the option, immediately exercise it, okay? And I will end up buying the option at 70. And because the market price is 100, I'll be able to sell that at 100. And so I'll knock in a profit of $30. Is this clear? Is everyone clear now what intrinsic value is? Yes, sir. Okay, so intrinsic value is basically just remember it logically as that. Whatever is the profit that you can lock in by buying the option and exercising it immediately. Okay, based on the current market price. Okay, so intrinsic value. So now to answer Pranam's question, because we know that time value, I'm uh, sorry, uh, that option premium, the total option premium is time value plus intrinsic value. So now we are going to answer Pranam's question by saying that uh, time value is option premium minus intrinsic value, which is the third line. Is this clear? Is everyone clear about the scheme? So essentially time value is not, is figured out indirectly. Okay, You do not directly figure out the time value, you figure it out indirectly by observing the option price. Remember the option premium, you can observe it in the market. The option price is available in the market. Okay, this is not the option fair value. We are talking about the option premium, which means option price. So the option price is available in the market, right? So when you look at the option price, and then you can figure out, based on the parameters of the option, we can figure out uh, how much the intrinsic value is. Is that correct? What happens, Satyam? Is it grinning away to glory? You're going to lose some points because you're grinning away. We'll do that later. Okay, so uh, is everyone clear about this? How to figure out the time value? Any doubts? Double A, are you clear? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. Sorry? Option premium is the so the option premium is the price of the option. Okay, so if you look at any example. No, that's okay. You can just move the thing and it'll come back. Okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, so uh, Gary's question is what is the option premium, okay? So the option premium is the price of the option. So if you look at, for instance, we have a link over here. There's a hyperlink. If you click that, it'll give you the option prices for Microsoft, okay? So here we have all these option prices. These are the call prices and these are the put prices, okay? So you look at the last price. So when you go to an option display board like this, okay, you will see these prices being shown, okay? So this is for the this is for the 75 strike. Okay, you see the last price of the call is 3339. Okay, this obviously pertains to a particular maturity. We'll show you one view from this. Actually, if you see this, it's a little better. This is the shot of the uh, trader workstation. You can see here the different. Uh, here you can see the different uh, maturities. Can you see that? This is for Jan 3, which is hardly any days left. Okay. Um, this is actually gone. This is uh, this is actually old. This this is actually a YouTube video because I didn't want to load the whole software. We would have hogged up a lot of memory. So this is an old uh, YouTube video displaying the uh, trader workstation. Okay. So when you're talking about uh, this is option volume bid ask. Okay. All right. So this is your. So how will you figure out uh, answer to Giri's question? What is the option premium? All right. In this case, what is the underlying asset, guys? Can you see a, a clue here? SPY is the underlying asset. Okay, this is your typical TWS option trader display. Uh, at this kind of view, this is called a tab view here. Okay, so it shows you the puts and the calls, and uh, the price of SPY, as you can see here, the current price is 270. Okay, so roughly 270 is the current price. And so this will be highlighted here and then you see the shading. So we'll come to that and we are coming to some other terms as well. But this is where answering uh, Giri's question, this is what the option premium is, it's the option price. So when you're looking at any option display software, like the Yahoo Finance pages I showed you, and this is actually better, you will get it live, okay? So here the option premium are this, 0 0.7, 78, 82, okay? Here you can see here one and two, okay, these are the option premium. Okay, this is because this option has, this, these are very low because essentially uh, this option, if you see, uh, has very, this is zero, this is basically expiring today, all right? And these are all the different maturities. So the point to understand is remember that one of the things that we had to specify while looking for an option price was uh, the number of days to expiration. Remember, expiration date was one of the things we had to specify. 
Yes, sir. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to ask for an option price yes, because the dealer is going to tell you what what is the tenor of the option. Okay. So this is where in your TWS, uh, in your TWS, this is where you'll see the various options for, and you can click on more and get more options. These are the expiration date options. Okay. So do you want it for Jan 10? Do you want it for Jan 12, etc. Okay. So therefore, any the expiration date when you're looking at a set of prices, these are your premium. These are your premium. This is where ask, these are your premium. Okay. This is option premium. Nothing but the option price. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So uh, intrinsic value, time value, and option premium is clear to everyone. Yes. Okay. You look at the option premium that you will get on any option display. Okay, on Yahoo Finance you might get slightly delayed feed and uh, here you will get live feed on the TWS. So you look at the option premium, you look at the strike of the option, you look at the, these are the strikes. So what is the logic for figuring out the intrinsic value and the time value? Let's do the steps, so just that your basics are very clear, okay. Because so these are new terms, right? Intrinsic value is a new term for you guys? You've learned it before, but then what is the problem? Then everyone should have been able to give me the answers straight away. So you've done it before in FM1. Yes. Okay. All right. Anyway. So uh, so this is it. So basically, you look at the option premium. Then you look at the underlying price, and you look at the strike. Okay. You look out. You figure out how much money you can make by exercising the option immediately. Okay. And that's your intrinsic value. And then you deduct the intrinsic value from the option premium. You get your time value. Is this clear? Yes. Steps are clear. Okay. All right, so let's go on to the next topic, which is we now have to look at. You notice the shading that you see in most of the option displays. You can see the shading. This blue shading. Okay. Now, what is not, uh, See, suppose you take two seventy as the actual price of the uh, of the underlying. Okay, two seventy point five. If you take that. Okay. Now you so notice that the puts here, the puts here. So what is a 270, let's say let's take the 274 put, okay? The put with a price of 274, what is the intrinsic value of this put? 4.5. 4.5, why? How did you figure that out? The, uh, I should actually maybe move from this side. The, uh, I'm asking you about the 274 put over there. 274 strike, the put price is around say 370. The premium that we can see roughly if we average the bid and the offer, it's around 370. Okay, so why is this? Uh, so I'm asking you now, what is the intrinsic value of this? Okay, is my question clear? We are pointing to the 274 strike. We are interested in the puts. So we look at the put price premium and we see that if you average the bid and offer, it's around 370, let's say. So my question to you is, what is the intrinsic value of the 274 put? Yes? Anybody, any answer? Is my question clear? Yes. You're just doing a test and you guys have already done these concepts before, right? So 274 put. The premium, option premium, we are going to just uh, uh, average the bid and offer and we say the average uh, premium is 3.7, okay? That means $3.70, okay, per share. So when you pay, when you actually buy this in the market because the market lot for US equity options is 100 units, 100 shares. So what you are actually going to pay if you if you buy this, an average let's say 370 is the choice price, then you will pay $3.7 per share into 100 shares. So one option contract, one put option contract if you want to buy, it will cost you $3.7 into 100. This is clear? This is how you figure out the actual cost. Okay, now my question is, you already know what intrinsic value and time value is. Now my question is, what is the intrinsic value of the 274 put? 4 
She, he also said something along the lines of 4. Somebody said 4.2. 3.7. So Rahul's answer is correct. 3.7. Sorry, I'm using a pointer on you. Okay. So uh, Rahul's answer is correct. 3.7. Now Rahul, tell us why you got 3.7. Okay. Very good. So uh, strike price minus current price. Remember, we saw the formula in the previous display. We, sh we showed you the formula in the previous display that for calls it was uh, underlying price minus strike price is the intrinsic value. So he has just used the formula, right? And so for calls the formula was underlying price minus strike price is the intrinsic value. And for puts the formula was strike price minus underlying price. Okay. Even if you don't use the formula, you should have been able to use the logic. What did I say? I said that the law. The way to figure out intrinsic value is to ask yourself how much money can I make if I buy this option and immediately exercise the option and then square my position in the underlying market. Okay, so that is the logic you should go through for determining the intrinsic value. How much money can I make if I buy this option, step one. Step two, exercise the option. Step three, square my underlying position because when you exercise the option, you end up with a position in the underlying asset. Is that clear? Because an option is a, a right to buy or sell the underlying asset. So if you exercise the option, you will have a, some kind of position in the underlying asset. Is that clear? Yes. Because you would have either bought or sold the underlying asset. So you would be either long or short. And then third step is you must immediately square that position in the, uh, in the uh, underlying asset market. Which is, in this case, if you exercise the put, in the, if you exercise the put, you will have a short position in SPY. Is this clear? You will have a short position in SPY if you exercise the put. Is everyone clear about that? Yes, sir. Yes, double A? Yes, sir. You are clear? Yes. Ishan, are you following? If you exercise the put, you buy the put in step 1. In step 2, you exercise the put. That gives you a short position in an SPY. Yes. Is that clear? Yes, then you don't want to be left with a position. Okay, it's like CRA. You want to be squaring all positions and locking in a profit. You have to think from that point of view. How much money can you make by doing that? Squaring out all positions, buying, selling, and then what is the profit that you can make? And that's the intrinsic value. So you buy the, you sell the. If you exercise the put, you sell the, uh, you spend sell SPY at 270, 274. Yes. Because we looked at this particular uh, option, 274 strike. You bought it at 370 and you sell it at 274. Okay, so you you uh, the intrinsic value is you get the right to sell the option uh, underlying SPY asset at 274. And when you sell it at 274, you you don't want to be left with a position. You also want to buy it back. And what is the cost of buying it back in the market? 270.3. Okay, so that's how Rahul gets his three dollars seventy. Intrinsic value, the profit you make is three dollars seventy. Is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is how you derive intrinsic value. You go through these. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so is this clear? Just remember the logical, the theoretical steps. Okay. If you don't remember the steps and revise it a few times, you'll forget. It's a very simple question. You should have been able to answer it. Everyone should have been able to crack it. So intrinsic value. Uh, how much money can I make? Just remember it in the English language. It's easier to remember it this way, okay? Because by nature, we don't think mathematically. We think in language, right? So how much money can I make if I step one, buy the option, whether call or put. Step two, exercise the option. Step three, immediately square my resulting underlying asset position in the, in the market by doing the offsetting trade in the market for the underlying asset. So your first trade is in this, your first trade is in this market, in the option market. Your first trade is in the option market. Remember, this is the derivative market here. 3.7 is the price for the derivative, that is the option. You buy it here, you transact in this market. Step, step two, you exercise the put option that gives you the right to sell. So you go short the underlying asset, but you don't want to be left with a position. So you also want to do another offsetting trade in the underlying market, which is the long trade. Okay, so you buy back at 270.3 and you sell at 274 because the right of the, the put gives you the right to sell it at 274. Is everyone clear about this? Right? Yes. Give me a sort of uh, strong responses so that yes, we can move on to the next topic. Okay.
So this is uh, so it's good that we did the exercise to test uh, intrinsic value and time value. Okay. All right. So these are some other terms that we need to look at. Is this okay? So right now, please also be clear about what are we learning in this module. We learned about uh, intrinsic value, time value, option premium. Okay, how to figure out intrinsic value and how to answer Pranav's question, what is time value, option premium minus intrinsic value. Okay, now we have to learn some other related terms, ATM, ITM and OTM. Anybody knows this? Anyone has drawn cash lately? Add the money, in the money. Add the money, in the money and out of the money. So you guys have already done these concepts? Okay, any need to revise it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's a need to revise it? Yes, sir. Okay. So essentially, let's look at this. This link is already given in your. Uh, uh, so this is all given here. Okay. Let's see if we have anything written here. Okay, never mind. We'll just write it down here. Uh, okay. So who can give me a good formula for writing? Can we write um, ATM in terms of IV? ATM implies IV equal to what? IV, you understand what IV is? Intrinsic value, okay? So in this context, uh, we when we say IV, we don't mean eyeball. We mean intrinsic value because we are discussing the intrinsic value module, okay? So if I say ATM, which uh, Dhanu just clarified, ATM stands for? Add the money, okay? Uh, uh, IV is equal to what? Option premium minus time value. No, no, that's just the general formula for IV. Now, let make sure you understand my question, okay? Uh, let me just write all the questions down. OTM. Um, okay, let's write it in in, in another term uh, in, in other terms because there will be cases where let's write it. Um, strike price equal to. How can we write this? Who's going to tell us? Add the money is equal to the current price of underlying. Okay, so that's AA has given us the answer. So add the money, how do you identify an add the money option? An add the money option is where the strike price is equal to the current price of the underlying asset. Okay, let's write this quickly. So we, this is how you should remember it. Okay. So OTM and and I'm going to change that. Obviously, what is the one? ITM? This we'll define only for calls. Okay, we're going to define this only for calls. It'll save us some work in terms of writing. And so ATM is true for both calls and puts. And um, okay, so OTM and ITM I'm going to define only for calls. The puts part you can write yourself and figure it out. Okay, so uh, let's. All right. Uh, so, what should we write for OTM, guys? Strike price is what? What is the relationship between strike price and current price of underlying? For call options, Shivani is saying, out of the money, the strike price. So, what she's defining is for call options. She's saying, out of the money option means the strike price is greater than the current price of the underlying. Is this clear? It just should be logically apparent out of the money means no chance of making money. So what, what when will that happen when the strike price is above the current market price in the case of a call. Okay. So we could write this in another way. We I'll just change the writing. So in this case we say it is greater than. Okay. Alright, strike price is greater than. So therefore in the money for calls will mean less than okay so actually the other way to write this is to say that when the strike price is greater than the underlying price 
the calls are out of the money and what are the puts we can just focus on this part of the uh, the writing we can write it another way i'll do it later i don't want to waste the time in the class now but if the strike price is above the current price then the calls are out of the money and what are the puts the puts are in the money is that clear yes, sir. in that case the puts are in the money yes, sir. because if the strike is greater than the underlying you can make money by selling buying the puts and exercising them is that clear? So the better way to write this would have been to say that okay, strike price greater than current price of underlying, calls are out of the money, puts are in the money. Yes. And in this case, when the second line, which is when uh, strike price is less than the current price of underlying, then the puts are puts are out of the money, calls are in the money because you can make money by using the calls. This is clear by trading in the calls. Are you following, Karina? Okay. All right. Okay. So um, what we have to do now quickly is let's move on to the next step. So we've learned a few other terms. You revise some of these terms. Were already taught to you before. That is just a link to. Okay. So one thing you have to be clear about the shading. You can see the shading here. What is the underlying price of Microsoft? It's one twelve. Okay. Remember this figure. One twelve. Then I'll show you the shading. So most, in this case, in Yahoo Finance, the display for Yahoo Finance for Microsoft calls. Let's note the uh, expiry, 1st of March, that's too close. Let's take something which is uh, further out. Okay, now we are looking at June expiry. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. The underlying price remains the same because it's the spot price. Okay, so let's go down to where we are near 112. So the underlying price, please note, is between these two strikes. These are the strikes. Okay, so the underlying price is between 110 and 115. So you notice typically when you look at all option displays, they will have a shading scheme. So in the Yahoo Finance scheme, in the Yahoo Finance display, okay, uh, what are they shading? Uh, my question is, on the left-hand side of the calls, you can't see that uh, column heading. On the left hand side you have the calls and on the right of the strikes column, this is the strikes column. Okay, this is your strikes column. This is the strikes column. On the left are the calls and the, on the right are the puts. Okay, so what are they uh, What are they shading? Are they shading the in the monies or the out of the monies? Yes, everybody says in the money? Okay, is everyone, anybody has a different view? Ria, what is your view? They are shading the end the monies. But you are not convinced, you are just repeating what people are saying. What is the logic? Few more sessions left. After 7-8 sessions, your term will be over, program will be over. What? This is 17 sessions and you are going to only 4 sessions. are left, okay. So Ria is very relieved. But we are not going to let her go. Uh, she was really even before the course started. There is only one course left. Okay. All right. Tell me why. Which one? What's your view? What are they shading? By shading, I mean the blues here. This blue shading. So they are they shading on the right hand side. These are the puts and these are the calls. So what are they shading? In the monies or out of the monies? Is my question clear? You don't know? Okay. Okay, so in the money, they are shading the in the money. Okay, you can see that because the, look at any randomly chosen shading, shaded put, the strike is 130. Mm -hmm. So 130 strike is higher than the underlying price. So the underlying price is now 112. Okay, and here what are they shading? All the stuff which is the calls which are the strikes of the calls are below the underlying price. All the strikes are below, so that means these are the in the money calls. And these are the in the money puts. So typically in any display you'll see that the in the monies or the out of the money, whatever scheme they have, they will shade those. Okay. Look at this. Here, underlying prices. In this case, the underlying price is 270.30. And what are they shading here? You can see the puts, the blue puts are being rear pay attention here. Make sure you learn this. And whoever else was not clear. What are they shading here? Let's take a random put. The blues are shaded here. 273. So this 273 is what? In the money? 
when the underlying is 270.3 in the money so, yeah so the here also they are shading the in the monies are you following the logic so in any option display board most generally they will shade the in the monies but you need to be clear about this is a software based convention so some of them may decide to shade the out of the monies okay some may even give you an option do you want to uh, shade the in the monies or the out of the money so this is a software based feature but you will look you you will see that some some set of prices always shaded okay that's the in the money or the out of the money okay We have to quickly go through some very important parts which I want to cover here. Okay, some of the option sensitivities that we are going to cover now, some of the names that you need to be aware of, we won't go into the intricacies of this at this point. So if you look at any option pricing model, okay, that you can see here, uh, let's look at this, okay. So we've already, we have looked at this option pricing model before, okay. So if we make this a little smaller, all right. You can still read. So can you see this? That when you get when you get the option price from any option pricing model, uh, they will also give you certain values for the Greek letters. These are called the Greeks. So if somebody asks you in an interview, what are the option Greeks? Okay, don't pay, pass out or something like that. Okay. So these are the option Greeks: delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho. Okay. These are the option Greeks. Strictly speaking, vega is not a Greek letter. So sometimes people use, uh, this is there in your notes, so sometimes people will use uh, lambda or uh, kappa to refer to vega because vega is not a letter in the Greek alphabet. These are from the Greek alphabet, delta, gamma, theta, rho, these are from the Greek alphabet. And what are they representing? Okay, guys, please be, uh, pay attention here, okay? So is this first point clear? You should know the lingo. These things are called option Greeks. So if somebody asks you what are the option Greeks, this is what you tell them on the, in the first line of your answer. No, we'll come to that. But in the first line of the answer, you say delta, gamma, vega, theta. Although vega is not a part of the Greek alphabet, we still use it to, uh, it's included as part of the, you can say, you can mention this also, that uh, vega is actually the most commonly used term, but strictly speaking, is not a part of the Greek alphabet. So you can clarify this. So people who want to be strict, they will say kappa or lambda. But that's very uncommon. Normally, people just say Vega. So remember, these these are the option sensitivities. So look at the option price. Look at the option price model. How many inputs can you see in this model? Underlying price, exercise price, three days till expiration, four interest rates, five dividend yield, six vol. Those are uh, come on. Those are not eight. These are rounding. Is not an input. Graph input and increment. Those are not. You have to think theoretically. Okay. Those two are basically the last two that you see. Rounding and graph increment. Those are actually software-based uh, uh, features. Okay. Because this particular of software software has given you this option of rounding. Some software may just lock you into some fixed rounding. Okay. So there, it's not eight inputs. There are only six inputs here. Okay. All right. So. Broadly, what the, so the first thing you learn is what are option Greeks? These are the letters. Okay, these are option Greeks. Second is what exactly are they? Okay, these are essentially the sensitivities of the option price with respect to see uh, what is the output in this? What is the endogenous variable in this model? Is this a model or not? It looks like a, you can't see the form of the model, but it is a model. Okay. So it is a mathematical model as we learned. It's a relationship between, you can't see the specification of the model because it's not shown to you. But uh, you can see that if you change the inputs, you'll get a different set of outputs, okay? So it is a mathematical, there is a black box. Uh, for you now, it's like a black box model because you don't see the process. You don't see the specification of the model, okay? If you change the inputs, obviously your theoretical price will change. Look at the call option price. Remember the call option price, I'm gonna change the input, okay? I'm going to make this 90. Okay, remember the call option price? Has it changed? Yeah, option premium is the output, correct. So in this case, can you see the change in the theoretical price? 
So this is the model output. So remember this, how do we put this into the framework that we studied? One minute. Yeah, one second. So let me take the pointer. Maybe I should go from that side. Okay, so uh, here. So please understand, what did we study as the structure of the model? These are the inputs, okay, to the model. This, 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 and this, okay? So these are the inputs that we have into the model. And what is the output? The, the, the output of this model is the call option premium, okay? The put option premium actually is derived by a mechanical relationship. Did you guys do put call parity? Yes. You did put call parity? Uh, parity? You did it. Now you forgot it. Yes, sir. Okay. So put call parity is at one minute. We only, we've just covered CRA. You just covered CRA. What is CRA? What happened? Where are you whispering to him? I am asking the question. Yes. What are you saying? What is CRA? Classical riskless arbitrage. Okay. So CRA, you understand how CRA is done? So put call parity is a relationship, okay, which must uh, obtain between prices of calls and prices of puts. If there's any deviation from put call parity, you can actually do CRA, okay, assuming there are no trading restrictions in those option markets. You can actually do CRA and make the prices converge, okay. So put call parity is an example of uh, when you use put call parity to value the put option, that's an example of AFP, applying AFP valuation principles, okay? Because I think anytime there's a deviation from that price, just like in the Delhi example of Delhi sugar, because the AFP fair value was 65 rupees and the price had diverged from that, it was 75 rupees. So therefore, Bola was able to do the arbitrage and uh, and capture that 10 rupee profit and eventually as everybody starts doing it the price has to converge to the fair value you remember that yes, sir. okay that logic so uh, put call parity is another example of afp based uh, fair value okay which relates the price of puts to cost so in this model okay you can't see the mathematical form but the option premium as shivani correctly pointed out the output of this model the endogenous variable okay what are the other two terms for outputs and endogenous variables Dependent variable, forecast variable. Okay, so four four terms you should remember. Whenever you see an output, you should also remember three other terms. You see an output for a model, you should remember three other terms: endogenous variable, forecast variable, dependent variable. Whenever you see inputs, you should remember three other terms. Okay. All right. So in this model, I'm just telling you, you can't see the form of the model. It's a mathematical model. Okay, and it's a fair value model where uh, the output of the model is the call option price, okay? And then the put option is derived by a mechanical uh, formula, okay? So through that is put call parity. So the output is the call option price, and here the you see all the different inputs, okay? Only six inputs are shown here. So what the Greeks are showing you, okay? What the Greeks are showing you is, this is all there in your notes, so no need to write it down is what happens you saw what happened just now the call option price was around three dollars something you saw that it was around three dollars something what did i do i changed the exercise price which is another way of doing that is to essentially say that i've moved i've moved the underlying price i could have also kept the exercise price the same i could have shifted the underlying price okay so the delta essentially measures the uh, sensitivity of the option price so do you understand what is meant by sensitivity that if, let's say, let's put it this way, that if uh, yogurt prices, yogurt is made from milk, so if milk prices shoot up, then eventually yogurt prices will also go up, yes, right? So we can say that, uh, but there is some processing involved as well, so it's not that the yogurt price is equal to the milk price, but it is connected, okay? The milk price is an input in the yogurt price, okay? So what we can say is that the yogurt price will have some sensitivity to the milk price, can we say that it's kind of like elasticity or that kind of concept okay it's a first derivative concept that if the price of milk rises by 10 rupees per liter then the yogurt price will rise by some maybe 11 rupees or something like that we can say something we can put up a formula is this clear to everyone okay so we can actually derive a uh, formula for you able to follow this that's a sensitivity because the yogurt price is the output which depends on the input which is the milk price. So we can derive a sensitivity of the yogurt price to the milk price. 
Is this clear? Okay. So it's the same concept here. So the delta is the sensitivity of the option price to changes in the underlying price. Okay. You can think of it as changes in the intrinsic value. I changed the exercise price. I could have just kept the exercise at 100 and moved the underlying to 110. Okay. Same thing. Intrinsic value remains the same. Okay. If I keep underlying at 100 and move the exercise to 90 or I keep exercise at 100 and move the underlying to 110, intrinsic value remains the same. Okay, so the delta is essentially responding, delta is showing you the, responsive, uh, the responsiveness of the call option premium to a change in the underlying price. Okay, now if you, you can go and do this exercise at home, if you increase this 100 to 101, you'll see that approximately this price will go up by this amount, approximately, okay, one or two points, uh, second decimal, there may be a difference, okay. But approximately that is what will happen. Are you following now what this is? Okay. So these are the Greek letters. What are they called? Delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho. Okay. And what do they represent? Okay. These are their names. And what do they represent? They represent the, because basically then you talk about the option pricing model. You have an option pricing model. Okay. Which is what the market calls it. Actually, it's an option valuation model. So in the option pricing model, because it's a model, it will have inputs and outputs. Okay, so the output is the call option price and the inputs are all these things here. These are all your inputs. Okay, so obviously if you change the values of the inputs, the output value will change. So therefore, uh, because there are so many inputs, there are so many sensitivities. Okay, so each of these measures the sensitivity of the output to changes in any of these inputs. Are you following the basic scheme? Okay. So what is the underlying price? Underlying price is the spot price. That's because this is a uh, this this option this model is pricing U.S. equity options. Your underlying could also remember we discussed when we talked about options for the big when we started out on options. The underlying could also be a futures contract. In the case of a compound option, what will be the underlying? Compound options. What will be the underlying in the case of a compound option? Sir, options. Option. Okay. Giovanni is the only one who seems to be remembering stuff. Okay. So I discussed this with you. The compound option is a very exotic type of non-standard option contract where it's an option and an option. So it's an option, but the underlying is also an option. So it's like a call on a call or a call on a put, a put on a put on a put or a put on a call. Okay. It's almost like Betty bought a bit of butter. You get confused. Okay if you are not careful. Alright, but the point is option pricing model has a bunch of inputs and it has an output. So if you change the inputs, the output value will change and the Greek letters measure the sensitivities of the option premium to the changes in the different inputs. Okay, so delta responds to underlying price, gamma responds to actually the rate of change of delta. Okay, this is a slightly more complicated, this is a second order, this is a second order, second derivative effect. These are all first derivative. Vega. Vega responds to, Vega refers to the changes in the ball input. Remember the ball is also an input in the option pricing model. What is the ball? Okay. So if I change the ball, the premium will change and that is measured by the Vega. Okay. Theta is measuring the change in response to changes in uh, this figure, tenor of the option. Okay. These are all there in your notes. You don't need to note, uh, you don't have to take down notes here. But this is basically up to just remember that this response, this corresponds to this, and rho response, rho corresponds to interest rates. Okay, this is clear. Now, what we want to see essentially is, so is this clear? You learned about the option Greeks. Okay, now you know what the option Greeks are. If somebody asks you, okay, and you know what they're representing roughly. Okay, let's look at one thing here. Alright, so all this stuff is written in your notes. You can read, I've given you the corresponding reading from Hal Basu. Read all this stuff to see, to get an understanding of option sensitivities. Okay. Alright. Now, we want to be aware about certain terms. Okay. Now, here you're actually, you're not going to understand the logic behind it. I'm just going to give you the labels, kind of like an axiom right now. Because we need to uh, go through this a little quickly to, so that I can give you the trading rules. What is the framework that you're going to use for your trading? Okay, so uh, what you so what we use is we say that a short, long option position. And just read what I've written here. 
what this means is short option position is short gamma long option position is long gamma okay this is what we say uh, short option is short vega and long option position is long vega you understand about what is an option you understand what an option position is your long or short or some option okay it could be a call or a put okay so that's your option position if you are long a call option then your option position is long call is everyone clear okay so a long call will have both long vega and long gamma okay we are just kind of memorizing these things at this point because i need to go quickly to give you the uh, uh the trading rules okay then I've given you some rules on theta and beta. theta is also negative because remember this theta is unique because of theta is unique because of uh, this thing. Can this figure ever increase once you bought the option? Yes, Gaba. Sorry, tenor of yeah, tenor of the. So my question is, can this thing ever increase after you bought the option? This can never increase. This other stuff, all the other inputs can go up and down. But this thing goes in only one direction. It won't keep on decreasing. Okay? So what the theta should notice the theta is negative for both. Okay? In the case of the delta, you see that the call delta is positive and the put delta is negative. You can see those differences. But in theta, you see that both calls and puts have the same sign. Both are negative because theta measures the change in the option value with the passage of time so if you you can do this experiment change this 30 days to 29 days you'll see that the call option will drop by 0 0.026 approximately the value of the call option will drop by 0 0.026 so theta goes in only one direction it shows you for one day passage of time one day of uh, uh, time elapsing how much does the option price drop by is this clear Okay, so that's why we say that all long option positions will have uh, short will be negatively affected by theta here. That's why you see it has and that's why you notice this short option positions will benefit. So short is meant to connect to positive. Okay, short is meant to connect to positive. Long is meant to connect to negative. Okay because the long option position will lose value from the passage of time but if you go short options you will benefit from the passage of time is this clear yes, sir. okay now essentially in, in option trading main a very important thing that we want to show you this is where you're getting to your trading framework okay now eyeball what is the eyeball okay, let's look at the ball input first okay now notice what happens one minute guys notice what happens to the remember the call option price is ten dollars ten and a half dollars if I change the ball if I change the ball is right now 25 okay the ball is 25 let me just increase the ball dramatically make it like 35 so I'm increasing the ball what happens to the what is the sign of the Vega guys positive positive so what should happen to the option price it should increase okay so you can see that for yourself I change the ball input the ball input has changed from 25 to 35 option price changes from 10 and a half to 10.96 okay no not yet it will change uh, yeah it has changed okay fine let, I just wanted the phase to load fully okay so it has changed can you see a change in the option in the, in the very short dated option put option also increased in value okay so both options will increase in value so now uh, is this clear to everybody what this ball input is okay so basically the, the 35 uh, fluctuation price we can bear like this option no 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 that's not what it means you're asking about volatility right what this represents no so the ball represents okay the calculation of ball is a little more complicated we won't get into that at this point you can just think about okay let's say if you look at the uh, price of an option i want is the no, no, I'm just coming to that. Just imagine this. Okay, now let's look at some of these other uh, uh, things. Just focus on that. Uh, let's look at some of the other charts. Okay, if you look at, you guys can look at, the guys on the left can look at this chart. It's not showing here. The red line is not showing on the white screen. I don't know what happens with this. So if you look at this, if you look at the uh, standard, uh, this is the SPY chart. 
and on this side this is actually a uh, Microsoft chart okay so if you look at the underlying prices of uh, on the right side of the uh, projector screen I have uh, the Microsoft charts and on the left side extreme left I have the SPY charts so if you imagine this is a, this is time series data can you see that this time series data now if you imagine that if you imagine that I take the standard deviation of this data can I do that Okay, so we are going to just understand volatility in terms of in a, in a kind of an approximate way, not the exact way, but just to understand. So if you see here, I don't know why it doesn't come on the screen. Okay, so essentially if you look at this, okay, you guys can look at the other chart there. If you take, can I take the standard deviation of these data series? Yes, sir. It's possible. Okay, I can just take the closing figures and I do a standard deviation. Okay, so essentially, let's for the moment as a shortcut, let's just assume that volatility is standard deviation. So, what is this vol input here? Essentially, this is actually annualized movement. So, you're right to some extent, it is movement of uh, it is the amount of movement, it's referring to the amount of movement. So here when I put wall of 35%, okay, this is in percentage terms. What this means is that in one year, in one year I expect this, uh, this stock, this is the one step, you understand this one, one SD, two SD, you understand all those limits, normal distribution, Yes, sir. that 95% of the observations remain within plus minus one SD. Yes, sir. Remember all that? Yes, sir. Okay. So what is the ball input first? Let's understand this clearly. What does the ball input represent? It represents the one standard deviation annualized movement in the stock price. Okay, so if I put the input as 35, that means I'm saying that this particular stock, this particular stock on have for about 67% of the time, okay, uh, is going to remain within plus 35 to minus 35 percentage. Okay, so you take 100, so it is going to remain at 135 between 135 and 65. Is this clear? That is 65 percent of the time. Uh, 67. One SD is 67, right? So 67 uh, percent of the time, you will find that this stock will remain between 135 and 65. Are you following? This is an important concept. Make sure you understand this. Okay. For options, when we put in the ball input, essentially we are talking about we refine the formula a little bit, but broadly it deals with the. It's connected to SD. So it's a one standard deviation, annualized price change. That's what the ball input is. It's all written in your notes. You don't have to take notes, but make sure you understand it. So the ball input is meant to represent the one standard deviation, annualized price change. Okay, that is expected. Remember, this is a, this is actually a forecast. Because you don't know this. Nobody knows this. Are you able to follow? Okay, this is a forecast. Okay. But first, let's forget about the fact that it's a forecast, but let's understand what it is a forecast of. It is essentially telling you that over the next one year, I expect this uh, stock price to remain within 135 to 65, about 67% of the time, because it is a 1 SD range. This is clear? That's what I'm saying, okay? But this is a forecast, okay? Now we come to why I remember when I said this is actually why option prices are AFB, I mean uh, improperly so called, remember? Okay, now this is an example of an option valuation model or an option pricing model. Now all option pricing models will have the same problem. And what is that same problem? This, here. Now you understand why I have put all option valuation models into this category which is uh, AFV improperly so called that is it's called these are actually labeled as AFV valuation approaches but they're actually not free of arbitrage because this and this is true of all option valuation models no matter what you do okay no matter how sophisticated the model because this remember what is the true nature of AFV is there any forecast involved no forecast is involved you look at current market prices of related assets you buy here, sell there, lock in all your profits. No risk, no market risk remains. But that is not true in AFP, in option pricing models, okay? So the reason I put it under AFP is because in option pricing models, the theory of option pricing models, they use AFP principles, okay? But what do they do? Here's the beauty of most of the mathematical modeling, especially the very theoretical modeling in finance. 
you know what the option pricing model module as, uh, model assumes it assumes that this is known it assumes that this is known do you think this is realistic no, sir. nobody knows okay what this is going to be but the option pricing model assumes that this is known so under that assumption that's why it's an AFP model all option models use AFP principles okay so they pretend that there's not going to be any market risk but the crucial problem the reason I've called it improperly so called is because they assume that this is known and this is also they assume that it's constant okay there are some variations later for very uh, allowing it to vary but it assumes knowledge of the future ball which nobody really has okay you can never know this okay so actually it is a forecast based model but they are using AFB principles and making it look like an AFB uh, valuation model by assuming that the ball is known. It's like if you did your project NPV, if you did your project NPV by assuming that the project cash flow is 100% certain. Is there any project in the world where the project cash flow is 100% certain? No, sir. no. But if you did it assuming that it's 100% certain, then you could use AFB principles. Okay. If you knew the discount rate also with certainty, then you could see if there's changed any market price which is not equal to the fair value, then you could have traded and made money. So that is why I'm calling it this. So you understand this point, okay? So is this this is what ball ball is uh, the input? The ball input is is everyone clear so far? Yes, sir. Okay. Now here's an important. So this, this is basically the one standard deviation uh, price movement expected in the stock, okay, over one year, okay. Now, what is eyeball? Okay, what is eyeball? Implied warranty. Implied What is what is H for? H H for Hungary. H for. We clarified. I I clarified this uh, in the earlier class. That I'm not going to use long expressions. H for stands for historical volatility. Yes, yes, Eyeball stands for implied volatility. So I'm not going to use these long expressions every time. I'm just going to say H ball and I ball. Okay. And remember, it's historical, not historic. It's historical volatility. So anything that relates to the past. Okay. So now, ball. Everyone is clear about ball. Okay. Now the problem is that although this is that's why I call it an option valuation model. These are remember this is a theoretical price. This is a theoretical price. Okay. Now you may actually find that the actual market price is something different. Okay, so the actual market price might be something different. So theoretical price, this difference is arising. These are all known. This is known. Can you see these are all known? Yes, sir. What is the only factor here that is unknown in the inputs? Dividend, of course, there is a little bit of risk because like Kraft Heinz has cut their dividend. Okay, so but that large, you know, dividend yield also can be estimated reasonably well. So what is the only unknown here? The ball is the unknown. Okay, you don't know how much the stock will fluctuate in the future. The ball is the unknown. Is this clear? Everything else is known because I, I can see this in the market. I can see this. I can decide this myself. This also I can decide myself. Clear? This also is clearly known to us. Risk-free interest rate, we can figure it out. Okay, this there is a little bit of risk in the dividend yield, but we can figure it out. The ball is the big unknown. Okay. So essentially what have, what the option ball mod, option valuation model does is it tells you that if these are the values of the inputs and the ball is known with certainty, then this should be the theoretical call option price. Okay. Now you may have used a ball input of 35 to do the option valuation. Yeah, time is up. Okay, let me just explain one thing before we finish. So eyeball is just wait. We'll finish when I call the when I call the finish. Okay. So the eyeball is. I'll just give you quickly the the uh, the framework that you have to have in your uh, in your head. What eyeball is here? If you see this, this is the uh, S&P 500, uh, the SPY chart, and this is the plot of the eyeball. Okay. Similarly, here this one is the Microsoft chart, underlying chart, and this is the chart of the eyeball, the one which is in uh, orange. The eyeball, like these chart links, are all in your notes. Okay, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, but so what is the eyeball? Let's be clear about this. I'll just take two, three minutes extra. Uh, that is the eyeball. So, so this 
Based on a ball input of 35, you get a theoretical price of 50, trading in the market at a price of 15. The call option price, theoretical price is showing 10.95, but the actual market price of the option is 15. Okay. So now the eyeball is going to be that. So you can now then to reach a price of 15, should you increase the ball bit bigger or in, in decrease it? You should increase it. Okay. So you keep on increasing it until you can get a call option price equal to the market price. So it's clear? Yes. Until you get a call option, you can keep on increasing the wall. So the eyeball is nothing but the wall input which gives you a theoretical price equal to the market price. Is this clear? Yes. That eyeball, if you enter that figure in the wall in the wall field, the eyeball is the one which equates the theoretical price to the market price. The fair value according to this model will make will be made equal to the market price. Okay, so what you guys have to do is start tracking those uh, those eyeball charts that I've given you here, the eyeball utility here. Okay, you have to take a view on the eyeball. Remember, if the eyeball goes up, okay, if the eyeball goes up, what will happen to the option price? Nice, it goes up, right? So when you are buying options, if you are buying a call option, that means you are expecting the underlying to go up. But if you are buying an option, you are also expecting the eyeball to go up. So you have to start taking a view on the eyeball also. So option trading has one more complexity, not just underlying, but also the eyeball charts. You have to start eyeballing the eyeball charts. Okay? Alright, so you guys can go now. Okay, so we are done. Hi. Only three minutes. Okay, guys, can you do me a favor? Can you please close your? Uh, don't just shut off the screens. Can you do a soft shutdown of the PCs? Are you going to use the PC in Gaurav Sir's class after this? If you're going to use the PCs. Okay, then that case keep it. But after that class. Please shut it down guys. When you leave, please shut down the PCs. Okay? Do a soft shutdown and shut down the PCs. Alright, okay. Simani, you got it? Yes, what is the question? Call you? So when we will start uh, trading for Mon Monday, for Monday and uh, we will have to look at two charts. One is of the options that we are trading in and one is of eyeball. So there is a two view. We have to take two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just send you guys. I'm going to send you some instructions okay. via video. Okay. To so that you can start trading from Monday. So look out for that. Uh, I'll send you the video. Okay. Uh, and that will have the brief instructions that cover a little bit of the class course. And I'll revise it again in the next class. I'll send you the video today. Okay. So we'll have have to look at three things simultaneously. Simultaneously. What is the real time data? What is the chart? And what is what is the implied volatility? Yes, very good. Broadly, you're right. You'll have to look at the option prices, the data. Very good. Okay. Please, all the money, add the money, in the money are not intrinsic value. They are time value. Basically. No, no, no. The all the money, in the money, and uh, the last one, uh, add the money. These are referring to option types. I mean, what is the status of the option? It is like a, uh, it's like a status uh, value for options. So, whether the option, because the particular option right now, if it is in the money, like if you look at this, they don't have intrinsic value. No, no, no. See, so look at this. Okay, look at this option. And see here, this one is. Uh, these are actually. Oh, you can't see there. You can look at the screen. See, there's 274. You see, there's 274. Okay, so this 274 is the strike price. Okay, these are the puts. Okay, so here this put is a uh, and the underlying is 270.3. So we will say that the 274 put is in the money because here the strike is above the underlying price so that it has a uh, you know you can actually make money by uh, exercising this option that's why we say this put option is in the money for contingency value we minus this from this yes but not minus this seeing these things sorry which one you will say no, the, the first step is we have to see that bid and ask price yeah and then we have to go to no, this no. this is this we are seeing this i understand why you're confused hmm. this we only looked at because you 
you need to buy the option. You need to buy the option. And so when you buy it, you will be buying actually at 379. Hmm. But I just averaged the credit offer and I said 370. Hmm. Okay. So essentially, so this is just the price of the option. Okay, if you want to buy it at the market. But then if you want to exercise the put, first you have to be the owner of the put. If you are not the owner of the put, who will let you exercise the put? So that's why I point you to that first. That you have to buy. I understand why you got confused because the option premium now is equal to the intrinsic value. Okay? That is because there is no time value in this. See, zero days. Zero days left. Okay? So there is no time value in this option. Okay? So here you have, this is why it looks the same. So Rahul did not say 3.7 because of this. This is just the price of the option. So the step one is you have to buy the option. Okay, that will cost you around 3.7. Okay? Now, what he is doing is, he is then saying the option gives me the right to sell at 274. When I buy the option, I will have the right to sell at 274 on the stock. And the underlying stock has a current market price of 270.3. So when Rahul is getting answer of 3.7, he is actually getting it by subtracting 270 from 274, he is subtracting 270. We can directly get answer from this, why we are seeing these things. So, this I only looked at, as I said, this I only looked at because uh, I wanted to clarify the first step. You have to first buy the option. If you don't buy the option, how will you exercise it? If you are not the owner of the option, you can't exercise it. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, I should have maybe given you a different example because we are watching a video here, so I can't control the software. But if you look at an option where let's say it's 9 days or 3 months or something to the expiration, there you will see that the premium is more than just the intrinsic value, it will have some time value. Here, so remember the first relationship, premium is equal to time value plus intrinsic value. Okay. So in this case, because the option is basically expiring today, there is no time value. So time value is zero. So therefore premium is equal to intrinsic value. But he is getting 3.7 not by looking at this, he is getting it from here. He is getting it from looking at the strike price, price of the market price. Strike price of the put is 274 and the current market price is 270.3. So he is thinking that okay, first I will buy the option, then I will exercise the option. Thank you. Achha, can you one sec? Just hold on. We are probably putting it in the future. So this is the video. You just put it in Google Drive. How will you give? You will give it by pen drive. Pen drive, you have a name. 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 You have a all the steps because if you don't buy the option, you can't exercise. It. You're not the owner of the option. You have to be an owner of the option. So you buy the option, okay? And so in this case, your net profit will be zero because you spent 3.7 to buy the option. Then you exercise the option at 274. In this case, yeah, it increases the sale because there's no time cut. It's clear. But the calculation of intrinsic value comes from strike price minus underlying price for puts and uh, Underlying price minus strike price for calls. That formula is given in your notes. You can just check your notes. Thank you. Okay, welcome.